So thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon for uh, Fair Vote's first webinar of 2022. Um, I'm Rob Ritchie, President and CEO of Fair Vote. Um, for those seeking better elections and a truly representative democracy, we live in a time of great promise. The very challenges of our democratic traditions have led to an historic opportunity to advance comprehensive electoral reforms. I've led Fair Boat for almost 30 years since it started, grounded in a vision of lifting up structural electoral reforms nationally. Well, impossible, it's Rob. Uh, you couldn't have been doing this for almost 30 years. Impossible. <laughs> Is that a shock? But uh, tricky. You know, I was half my age at that time. I was 20s in my 20s, um, and so we were advancing change locally. Um, today's increasingly fierce partisan divisions and deterioration of our core democratic institutions have energized volunteers, fostered national debate, unlocked resources, and earned attention from policymakers as never before. Our core vision has never wavered. We must ensure that every voter can cast a meaningful vote in every election, embrace fair representation of Americans' diversity of thought and identity, and incentivize collaborative policymaking. What has broadened our movement is a sense of urgency that I think we all feel about the problem and the promise of viable solutions. This is a particularly inciting time for ranked choice voting. With impressive support across the spectrum, it's become the fastest growing electoral reform in the country. It's used in over 50 cities now, used for presidential and congressional elections in Alaska and Maine. The US House last year passed three pro-RCB measures. Uh, most recently by adding the Voter Choice Act to the Protecting Our Democracy Act. Five more cities passed RCB ballot measures. That means 15 cities have, have passed it uh, by an average of nearly two to one when it's been on the ballot the past few years. New York City and more than 30 other cities used R um, RCB last year, including 20 in Utah alone. Um, new leaders of New York City and Virginia won their party nominations in hotly contested races held with ranked choice voting. And new state groups keep forming. I bet we have a, a few representatives from, from those groups today, reflecting an urgent desire for a positive, viable path forward to making elections work for everyone. So across this year, we'll have regular webinars to share and analyze news where we can learn from change makers and thought leaders. We've had a whole series of great conversations already that you can find on our Fair Vote YouTube channel and stay tuned for announcements of what's coming next. So I'm about to introduce Andrew, our special guest in a moment. But before I do, I want to invite you to be involved in our discussion. If you have questions at any point during the conversation, please use the Q&A function. Our favorite team will monitor them and be ready to lift them up for me and Andrew to address uh, toward the end of our webinar. Given limits on time, your question is most likely to be addressed if focused on electoral reform. So I am really pleased to talk with Andrew uh, Yang today. Uh, Andrew's one of the most positive people I've ever met even as he provides a blinking scrutiny to our nation's most fundamental challenges. I suspect he's well known to most of you, but a few highlights. Andrew ran for the 2020 Democratic Party presidential nomination after being a business and nonprofit leader, and in a nearly unique way that is a testament, testament to his energy and commitment to ideas broke into the first tier of candidates. Named by President Obama as a, president, as a presidential ambassador of global entrepreneurship, He's the founder of the nonprofit organizations Humanity Forward and Venture for America. Uh, Andrew's New York Times bestselling book, The War on Normal People, helped introduce the idea of universal basic income into the political mainstream. A graduate of Brown and Columbia Law School, he lives with his family in New York City, where he ran for mayor in its first ranked choice voting primary last year. And also last year, uh, Andrew released a new book, Forward Notes on the Future of Our Democracy. He features the story of his 2020 presidential campaign, takes a penetrating look at a whole array of our policy challenges, makes his case for the forward party as a new political force in the United States, and lays out the imperative of structural electoral reform to create hope for truly addressing the policy challenges that we face. I was thrilled when he accepted our invitation to be a board member of Fair Vote Action, Fair Vote's advocacy arm that focuses 100% of its energy on seeking to win the changes we support. Andrew has already helped uh, directly a string of local ballot measures for renters voting in 2020 and 2021, wants to keep doing that and a lot more. And he's here um, to talk about his ideas, but find ways to win reform working with us and our growing network of change partners nationally in states and cities around the country committed to a better democracy. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Rob. Great to be here. Happy 2022. Thank you. So 
there's a lot of ways that we could start this conversation. We're going to, of course, get into elect reform and third parties and Fair Representation Act and so on. But if you read forward, which I really urge people to do, because it's it's just just a really uh, uh, fascinating story of your personal life and your ideas and your case for reform. What what leads someone like you who doesn't serve in the U.S. Senate or governor? or isn't a retired general who won a major war, you know, to, to believe that you could run for president. And I guess what advice might you have for people about getting into the arena of, of campaigns? Thanks, Rob. Uh, such, a, such a fan of Fair Vote and thrilled to be here with everyone today. If you're here today, uh, sign up and let, let's, let's get this done in states around the country. So what made me think I could run for president. It was certainly nothing in my upbringing because uh, I'm Asian, <laughs> I'm the son of immigrants and my parents weren't like, you're gonna be president someday. Uh, what, what happened in my case was I uh, went to law school, practiced law very briefly, became a failed entrepreneur and then had a bit more success, started a nonprofit. And during that time, a number of things hit me. Number one is that I didn't think we understood uh, the nature of the economic transformation that was uh, pummeling various American communities. And in my mind was one of the driving forces behind Trump's victory in 2016. Uh, but I'd also met a whole array of government officials, either past or present, uh, maybe a dozen senators, governors, members of Congress, uh, President Obama multiple times, um, ex-presidents Clinton and Bush um, at, at various events. So when I was around a bunch of these officials, a couple of things struck me. Number one is they did not seem like godlike superhuman figures. They seemed like people that, you know, some not dissimilar from people that I knew or worked with. And number two, they seemed a little bit trapped. <laughs> they seemed kind of stuck in uh, various rituals and motions um, in part because when I would see them, they would be in one of those events. And it just seemed like they were uh, doing this circuit. Um, and I didn't see massive changes coming from people who are participating in the circuit. It's like, in part, like if you're in the circuit, then you're kind of stuck. So those two things occurred to me over a period of maybe five years while I was running Venture for America. Um, I, I will say that being around a lot of these figures makes you feel like, okay, I can probably do a lot of what these people do. Um, so that's what led me to, to throw my hat in for the presidential nomination in 2020. Um, certainly, it seemed very rash at the time to most of my friends and family. My parents were not excited about that move either. <laughs> I have a history of disappointing my parents um, or worrying them. Um, but the, the campaign did end up catching fire. Um, and, and I'm really grateful to everyone who decided to get behind me. Rob, were you there? I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 there was a person right, right down my, my street. I'm here in Tacoma Park, Maryland. There was an Andrew Yang sign. I don't know. Must have been, must have been 2018. It was like really early. So one of your early adopters was right here. It is interesting. It, we have a very political town. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a small town, 15, 20,000 people. But, you know, the, your story about like uh, realizing that our political leaders are people like 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 you and me, like Jamie Raskin, the, the congressman who 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 just lives basically about 300 yards from where I am right now. Um, but he used to be on our board. He was a law professor that I knew, and he you know said he was like getting ready to run for state senate. And I'm like, oh, well, that's that's interesting. Like you're just you know, you're my friend Jamie, you're like getting ready to run for senate, and you know he 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 won back in 2006, taking on a like a, a 30 year incumbent and, and one, I coached a lot of basketball with Tom Perez, who's now, you know, had, had, had his old career and he's now running for governor. So I think your story about, you know, ordinary people can then run and start making things happen is true. And I'm just wondering if you, I'm sure met a lot of people now who are in thinking about that and what advice would you give to people about whether to run for office? The big question they, they should ask themselves is why? <laughs> Where, uh, and so I, I joke uh, about how no one would choose to be a musician 
um, because it's such a difficult road. Um, you know, you have to almost have this compulsion because you have this music that you want to share. Uh, ideally, that's what's driving you to run for office. Is there some burning issue or cause that you say, like, I'm not going to rest until I get this done? Um, because then it will get you through the hard times. People will sense that that's what you're about. Uh, you'll more likely uh, have uh, more of an impact, um, win or lose. Uh, I, I think thinking one of the frustrations I think a lot of people have with our current network or system is that you get the sense that a lot of people are running because it's the next thing. It's like if you're in politics and it's like, okay, I did this, then what's the next thing? And there are people that end up um, end up jockeying in this pyramid. Uh, and that's not compelling. <laughs> so so if, if, if you have something inside you, it could be democracy reform. It could be ranked choice voting. Uh, it could be nonpartisan open primaries. But if, if something really fires you up, uh, then I would deeply consider running. Uh, if there's some other motivation, less so. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I'll get so um, in your um, the book, you have a chapter called Rewiring Government, which, which gets into your, your case for the big electoral reforms we need to change. And you have this quote, we need to realign incentives and change the software of government so that our elected representatives can actually get something positive done, which seems like a nice goal do you want to say a little bit more about why you think that's urgent and why people should maybe run for office based on that vision? Things aren't going very well in the US, uh, in large part because our representatives' interests are somewhat disconnected from how people are doing. Uh, so the numbers I'd like to point out are that congressional approval rating nationwide is maybe 16%, 18%, 20%. Uh, the re-election rate for incumbents is 92%, 94%. There's a massive gulf. And that's largely because over 83% of seats are now safely blue or red. So if you're an incumbent and you get through your primary, you win. Uh, so then the incentives for you are just to avoid getting primaried and losing, uh, uh, which requires you to stay pure, whatever the heck that means. Um, and so you're less likely to compromise, which we're, we're seeing right now uh, locking up Congress, where even though the Democratic Party nominally has a majority, uh, we can see it's very, very difficult to get anything done. Uh, in an ideal world, you'd have members of both parties saying, well, I have to go home and show so I did something <laughs> or else they're going to vote me out. Uh, but that's not the set of incentives that right now our representatives have. It's not, can I deliver for you? It's, can I avoid being cast as ideologically impure uh, and get challenged in a primary? So it's a very, very distorted set of incentives. Um, and with that set of incentives, then you would expect very little good to get done. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing. Yeah. People like me, have, you know, who've been working on this for, for, for decades, have always thought these electoral reform voting rights made a lot of difference, but it always is with sort of something we care about that's sort of part of like the world we hope this this change democracy makes. But at the end of the day, we also have to make the case for the specific reforms. And one of the things I uh, have been very uh, admiring of is, is your ability to, to, to make a crystallized kind of explanation of ranked choice voting to make a case for it. So here with, with uh, I'm sure a lot of people who who do that themselves when they're talking to their friends. How, how, how would you describe ranked choice voting and why it matters? Wow, so ranked choice voting is a more modern voting system that allows you to rank more than one candidate. Uh, and it's transformative because it gets rid of the spoiler effect um, because uh, you can vote for multiple candidates and there's no accusation of wasting your vote. Uh, it rewards people who can appeal to a, a broad group of voters. You need a majority of people to support you, at least somewhere on your ballot, to win in most every case. Uh, it discourages negative campaigning and trashing your opponents. So it, it's uh, uh, an innovation that is long overdue, and it would get rid of a lot of the, again, messed up incentives with the current plurality voting system, where you're being told, well, you can't vote for anyone else, uh, or you're, you're going to mess it up for somebody. Um, so I'm again, so I feel like we all owe you a big debt, Rob, because you've been making this case for years and years. 
And I see my job as hopefully uh, mainstreaming it and spreading the word. So for those of you who are totally new to this, it's a more modern voting system that allows you to express your preferences for multiple candidates. Sounds like a, sounds like a good thing. So, so you, um, you did a little video about it passing in uh, when it was on the ballot in New York City back in 2019, urging people to vote yes. And it squeaked by with 73% of the vote. So um, obviously there was some good, uh, good work done by, by Common Cause New York and others to, to, to help make that possible. So tell me a little bit more about what it's meant for you personally and what it might have meant. Let's start with like the 2020 presidential campaign. I, there was only like you and Joe Biden. Was there anyone else running for president in the Democratic field that year? I think there were more. Yeah, yeah there were there were another 21 people. Okay, I actually sat right. down with one yeah, of them just now. There were 21 uh, people. So several states, actually, the state parties did use ranked choice voting. But if it had been part of the system from the get-go, if every state presidential primary contest and caucus had been using ranked choice voting, have you molded how that might have affected the way you campaign, the tenor of your campaign, the way it might have been kind of engaged with by, by voters? Well, honestly, it wouldn't have changed much of anything I did because I was Mr. Positive the whole time. <laughs> and so uh, I, I think maybe I would have uh, had some uh, joint events with more candidates earlier on, uh, particularly some of the candidates that were struggling to make various debate stages. Um, but ranked choice voting would have been a boon um, for sure because it enables you to uh, make appeals to people who might already have decided to support another candidate. And you're like, well, I just want to rank me second. And then there's like <laughs> no, uh, no stone left unturned. Um, I will say the Democrats played nice for the most part in the primary, um, you know, um, but ranked choice voting would have been an improvement for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it would have affected other candidates' behavior more than mine, probably. Yeah. So you know, there were four states that where all the voters used ranked choice voting. There was Alaska, Hawaii, Kansas, and Wyoming. And in those states, about 10% of the voters um, voted for someone other than Biden and, and uh, Bernie Sanders as, as a first choice. And of those 10% of voters, almost about nine and 10 of them ranked Biden or Sanders as a backup, meaning that if you looked at all the votes cast for active candidate or, or candidates that were on the ballot, 99% at the end of the day counted for either Biden or Sanders, you know, meaning that you know, nine out of 10 of the, the others didn't. Around the other states, there were about 3 million votes that went for candidates who had withdrawn from the field by the time that those ballots were counted. And if you use that same math, ranked choice voting would have kept in play probably you know, 2.5 million, 2.6 million more votes would have actually counted toward delegates. Um, well, that's I think, so, one of the compelling reasons for, for change. Well, one, one thing I will say that ranked choice voting would have been an enormous help with is it just gets rid of the entire electability argument. You know, um, so what you just described where, hey, Joe and, and Bernie were the last two standing and then maybe some other people voted for some other candidates. With ranked choice voting, you can say, look, just vote for whoever you genuinely like uh, and don't worry about any of like the wasting your vote or helping elevate a, a minor candidate because it'll all just get sorted out in the, in the process. Um, and, and that's something you can't underestimate. Uh, a lot of voters, unfortunately, are continuously strategizing in their head, um, mainly because they've been trained to do so. It's like, hey, if you vote for this person, then uh, how's it going to affect the ultimate nominee? Um, who do you want to face? The, the, the threshold question for everyone in the Democratic nomination process was who can beat Donald Trump? Uh, and so they would tend to support someone who they thought could beat Donald Trump. If you had ranked choice voting, then you can say, look, you can rank multiple candidates and not worry so much. Yeah, I thought a really telling stat for me was that right on the eve of the New Hampshire primary, where those voters in New Hampshire had gotten more love and attention from the candidates than you know any other state except Iowa. And more than half said they weren't decided on who to vote for. It's not that they didn't know who the candidates were at that point. They didn't know how to use their single choice yet to be most strategic or to be most, you know, they didn't know who was up or down and they wanted to wait until the last minute to make a decision. 
And I think ranked choice voting would be very liberating from that calculation um, to just be able to say, well, you know what, my first choice is, is this person. Darn it, and I've made that decision, and but I have a second choice too, and that matters. Yeah, exactly. That last day, you could be like, well, I know who I'm voting for, but like I'm still sorting out like second and third or whatever. That that would be a better place to be. So New York City, uh, running for mayor, that was a big pivot in your life in uh, May 2021, a, 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 I'm sure an exceptionally busy year and uh, running mostly in the era of COVID where, you know, uh, in-person campaigning wasn't quite what, what people uh, would want campaigns to be like. But um, a lot more people voted in, in that primary, you know, about 25% more people voted than in the last open seat race for, for mayor in 2013. And, and um, Ranked choice voting, uh, people, 99.7% of people cast a ballot ballot and so on. So you were right in the thick of it. So tell us a little bit about what that experience was like as a candidate to go from liking the idea to suddenly running in a big contest with it. Yeah, rank, ranked choice voting was a massive improvement. Um, and down the stretch, I even jointly campaigned with Catherine Garcia and said to my supporters, uh, rank her second. Um, and um, a lot of my voters actually did that. Um, and so it, it was really powerful. You know, it's something that could not happen under a, a plurality voting system. And, and like I said before, you could go to someone and if they said, hey, I'm supporting another candidate, you could be like, rank me second. And they'd be like, oh, let me, let me think about that. Um, you could, so you could speak to any community under any circumstance, even if it was uh in the you know hotbed of support of another candidate because you'd be like look just give me a look you know like, like rank me somewhere so that there was a, a vastly improved dynamic on that level um i'll say too the most fun thing rob is that walking the streets of new york ever since a lot of people come up to me and say hey i voted for you and um they don't tell me where <laughs> which is totally fine um, you know, technically true, like if they ranked me fourth or fifth, they could still just say like, uh, I voted for you. So as a candidate, you get much more of that than you would get otherwise, because, you know, unless just everyone lies. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, I, I think, you know, it's interesting, the winners in ranked voting elections, even when the final round, it looks like it was like, I don't know, 51 to 49 or something, which like the, the Eric Adams, Catherine Garcia mar margin makes it look like he had 51% only. But in fact, a lot of Catherine Garcia voters had indeed decided to rank Eric Adams second or third as well. So at the end of the day, the winners usually have 60, 65 percent of people gave them a, an, an affirmative expression of support that they they decided to engage with them, which I think speaks to this value of engagement and coalition building and learning about people that it incentivizes. It doesn't mean they have to do it. <laughs> and not every campaign is going to be uh, fully embracing that goal, but it does reward people that do. One, one thing I just want to insert there for a moment, Rob, is you're right that turnout went up, um, but the total turnout or the, the level of voting in the Democratic primary might have been, I don't know, 900,000, um, may, maybe 950,000 votes or, or something along those lines. Yeah, 950. Um, yeah, and, and so in a city of 9 million, you're talking about like 11% of people voted, in large part because it was a Democratic primary and you need to have registered uh, over four months in advance as a Democrat in order to participate. Um, so rank, cho rank choice voting is a massive improvement and I'm thrilled that they adopted it. Um, it would be even better if you had rank choice voting in uh, like a primary that was genuinely open um, because uh, in, in, like people should distinguish between RCV within a primary and then uh, you know having more open primaries themselves. That's a good pivot to like thinking about how this fits into our overall sort of structure because there's a ranked choice voting system you can apply in all different kinds of ways right and i think it makes a lot of sense in a lot of different ways but there are obviously relative impacts to how it's used so um almost every city and we're up to more than 50 cities you know uh, have adopted ranked choice voting uh more than 30 used it last year and and all the other cities except new york last year just had a single November election with ranked choice voting. That was that's the norm. Like Minneapolis and St. Paul and, and some other cities that voted last year. And um, so that's one model, right? Just get everyone in in on the ballot in November and rank. Um, any reaction to that? You know, it obviously gets trickier maybe when you're thinking about doing that for like big races for you know governor or something. But obviously a lot of cities do that. Do you? What's your reaction to that kind of basic way of using ranked choice voting? 
Uh, I, I like it a lot because it gets rid of that spoiler effect. Uh, you can have people running and, and um, not feel like you have to strategize. Um, you can have, for example, a minor party candidate run and then you can, and people can um, vote for that person first and then another par person second. Um, so it, it would be an upgrade in the general, it's an upgrade in the primaries. Um, it just tends to reward better candidates and better behavior. Uh, and even after you're in office, it provides better incentives for you to deliver for the people. Um, so, you know, it, it's a slightly different improvement in the general relative to the primary, but you can't lose with it. You know, it, it's, it just uh, um, gives people more ability to express their preferences. And voters, after they use it once, love it and want to do it again. It's just, I think it's one of these, like you uh, have to go through it once and then your comfort level shoots up. Um, most people are instinctively comfortable ranking candidates. It's just something we do naturally. Yeah, it's, it, yeah the, these exit surveys consistently are, are finding that it was, it was really high in New York, you know, I don't know, 75%-ish, uh, you know, uh, thought it was a good thing and, and they wanted to, to keep using it. It was about- And, and, and in New York, that's the equivalent of 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and then like 65% in Utah, first time use in all, all these cities. By the way, those Utah cities are a full mix of kind of, you know, more progressive areas, very conservative areas, a whole different kind of, kind of a uh, full array of, of, of voters and, and very strong support for, for this brand new system. So let's pivot to um, the fact that here, here we are, 2022. Well, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot for just a sec, Rob. Go for it. Put you on the spot. Is this your favorite ranked choice voting book? <laughs> it's, it's, it is, by golly, it is the newest ranked choice voting book. <laughs> I'll and take that, it. That makes it. It's, it's really your favorite ranked choice voting book of the last three months. <laughs> it, is, it is absolutely my favorite range of running book of the last three months. There, there are some really good authors who've grappled with it, but I bet uh, very few have sold as many books as Forward. So nice. Yes. You know, it's actually one thing that, that I find frustrating, Rob, is that people all bemoan polarization. And then uh, when you ask what to do about it, like they stop short of just saying we should use ranked choice voting, and, you know, which, which, by the way, would reduce polarization. Um, like it, it's hip to call out a problem. Um, uh, and then when, when you actually say, here's what to do about it, you know, a lot of people fall short of that. Um, so that, that's what I want to change. I want everyone to know, it's like, look, if you're concerned about polarization, you should be for ranked choice voting uh, in just about every environment. If you're, yes. And if you're concerned about ever like this sort of debate and this, like, it's interesting, we, we started in 1992 I was working really close with John Anderson, who had run for president as an independent in 1980. He was a great guy um, and um, had been a Republican, ran as an independent for president in 1980, and, you know, was really hurled the epithet of spoiler and splitting the vote, you know, even while he got about... People yell that at me. Oh, actually, no. When, when people yell something at me, it's like, hey, where's my thousand bucks, Yang? Like, people are <laughs> really very happy to see me. Um, but on social media, they're like already concerned about uh, <laughs> like that. It's it's this very strange knee jerk conditioning that we have to uh, to help people through. And and and, and righteous voting would just undo that, right? So that's you know it's 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 um, it 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 would be such a straightforward solution, and it keeps you know the problem keeps coming up. Howard Dean is a big fan of righteous voting, uh, a former chair of the Democratic Party and Vermont governor, presidential candidate, and. He wrote a great op-ed in the, the New York Times in 2016, kind of like just saying, look, we're in this cycle. We just finger pointing. It's like the third parties are angry at the major parties. The major parties are angry at the third parties. Let's just solve it. <laughs> Let's just use ranked choice voting. And that's, you know, kind of a very specific uh, solution that it provides that I'm sure would be interested to people. And, and, and this is one reason I love everyone who's here at the webinar today in Fair Vote is that you're solutions oriented. You know what I mean? Like, uh, again, it's sort of hip just to like yell and scream and say like that person is fouling it up. It's like, all right, let's fix it, you know? And then, and if people are concerned about the problem then you have to work hard at fixing it. So that's what Fair Vote's doing. That's what Rob's been doing for apparently 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly. And, and that's what we need the people here to do too. Let's do some work and actually solve it. Absolutely. So let me, let me, let me take about, so the congressional elections, 
all these U.S. House members, a lot of state legislative people are running in new districts, right? That we just went through this round of redistricting. Some states had independent commissions or standards that govern their process. Some were just totally brass knuckle politics, district line drawing. But no matter how they were drawn, they sort of ended up with one person representing each area. And because of the partisan tilts of this nation, you know, 70, 80, 90% of voters in each, all pretty much every single state are in districts that everyone knows which party's going to win there. Good old safe seats, very blue, very safe red. Seats. We did this report actually 25 years ago, as I date myself, called Monopoly Politics, kind of like doing some of these early partisan indexing to show how easy it was to project winners without knowing anything about the candidates. And now it's gotten just really easy to do that in extreme and everyone talks about it, but it's always been true as a problem. So we proposed in a problem solving way, okay, the problem is only having one person represent an area, right? If you have a bigger area or you just have more people in an area and use ranked choice voting and you use that in such a way that you can have like-minded voters win seats in representation to their in, in proportion to their support, like 25% wins one out of four and so on, you can really undo monopoly politics. You, you can fill in the, the spectrum and actually have people elect people no matter where they live. You can have non-Democrats win in New York City and non-Republicans in rural Oklahoma and so on. So that's embodied in the Fair Representation Act um, in Congress and Don Beyer and Jamie Raskin and others have put that idea forward. And I think it's more relevant every day I know it's still a relatively new, new, new idea for you, but I, I know you're getting a lot of questions about it. Just something a lot of our um, our supporters care, care care about. Just wanted to give you a chance to address the Fair Representation Act. Oh, I, I love the Fair Representation Act. Uh, you know, I think the the stark example I saw most recently is that 30% of Massachusetts residents are Republicans, but they get zero out of nine reps. Uh, you know, and you can go on the other side and find the opposite very quickly. I'm sure it's like 30% of uh, Missouri residents are uh, Democrats and it's probably inverted. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that a lot of people are just checked out on politics because they're like, oh, I don't matter. My vote doesn't matter. My party's never going to win. Generally correct. Uh, I think voters are smart and voters are rational. And it's one reason why people are so cynical because in 90% of districts, the minority party is impotent and irrelevant. And then if someone yells at you, it'd be like, oh, like, why don't you get out and vote? It's be like, because it's a waste of my time. <laughs> and they're right. You know, it's like, what are you going to say to that? Um, so the Fair Representation Act fixes it. it. It makes it so that you have a real shot at a multi-party democracy that might, by the way, get us through like this hyperpolarization that we're currently grappling with. Uh, so I am all for the Fair Representation Act. My only uh, hesitation in um, in it is that, uh, you know, it, it's gonna be tough to pass. Not not to say that that's like a, like a reason not to go do something because obviously I do difficult things all the time and <laughs> like people are like, oh, you can't do that. It's like, oh, let's go do it. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm happy to try and champion uh, individual state measures uh, that can move us in that direction. But the Fair Representation Act is where we should be trying to end up because even the reforms that I'm championing hardest right now around nonpartisan open primaries uh, and ranked choice voting, uh, the reality is that that might not necessarily, necessarily lead us to a multi-party system. Um, what it would lead us to would be better incentives for the people in office, which I will take. Like if you have to answer to 51% of your constituents and not just the most extreme 10 to 15%, like that's a huge win. Like you might actually do something. Um, but the end game should be a multi-party system and the Fair Representation Act is the straightest line to get us there. So speaking of parties, I, we're gonna get to uh, uh, questions here in just a moment, but um, so you've got the forward party and, and you've run as a Democrat, you've, you've run for mayor as a Democrat, you've run for president. Um, tell us about the, sort of this, this decision to do the forward party, how it interacts you know, in this hyper-partisan time where everyone's freaking out about, about things that might affect outcomes. How do you see the forward party operating and how does it sort of fit in with your sort of theory of changes coming to America? 
When I was writing my book, uh, I was trying to figure out why we're so stuck. Um, I arrived at the same problems you arrived at, Rob, which is like, hey, we're stuck because our system's not genuinely representative. Um, you have this two-party system that's going to uh, end up making significant changes very, very difficult to come by, um, by the numbers. Uh, and you also have this polarization that's going to um, make us insane and lead us to political violence and Civil War 2.0. So let's say those are the, the problems, which they are. Uh, so the question is, how do you change this dynamic and, and solve for it? And in my mind, it would be something like the Fair Representation Act. The problem is that uh, if you're either major party, you're not really incentivized uh, to start a more dynamic um, political system because guess what? Uh, or even let's say you're a political consultant, check it out. Let's say you're in a blue state, let's call it New York. Let's say uh, it's run by the Democrats and then you're a political consultant who um, helps get people elected or helps lobby or whatever. And then I come to you and say, hey, you know what you need? Uh, more parties in New York state. Uh, are you gonna be excited about that? You'd be like, wait a minute, like I don't know how that system works. Like I've got this system pretty well figured out. Um, and so everyone's going to try and keep it from happening. Um, so when I was writing my book, I said, okay, here are the problems, here are the solutions. Let's call it the Fair Representation Act just for fun. Uh, so how do you get that done? And the way you get that done is by creating a movement around democracy reform. Uh, and one of the drawbacks to a lot of the things we do is that you don't really have a tribe or a banner. Um, one of the conclusions I drew over the last few years, also in my book, is that politics is tribal. Um, it's one of the reasons why we're in trouble, because you have these two giant warring tribes and anything this side does, this side, you know, it's like clashy, clashy. So what you need is you need a different political dynamic, and then you need a new tribe that's going to say, look, what we need is uh, better systems, better elections, better uh, representation. Uh, and so it was a little bit circular, Rob. It's like chicken or the egg. It's like, well, you need these changes. You can't get these changes unless you get millions of people together. How do you get millions of people together? You're not going to be able to do it, in my opinion, um, effectively within one of the major parties because you're asking the party to change its own um, uh, ability to rule. Um, and so that, that led me to, well, you need to start a, a new uh, party, a new movement. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I concluded this at the end of 2020 and then said, I, I, so I don't have it in me to say someone should do this and then not try and do it myself. Um, especially when in this case, I was maybe the most logical someone to do it. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm not the most logical, but I'd say I'm like top 10. <laughs> like if you were to like line up people be like, who would start a third party that tries to champion democracy reform? I, I'd like to think I'd be on that list. Yeah, and 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 so I, I think I saw, and I'm, you would uh, have the number, uh, but um, a relatively large percentage of your supporters when you were running for president weren't sure they would vote for anyone else. That they that you had sort of brought them into the party. Is that is that right? And sort of yeah, forty two percent of my supporters weren't sure if they'd support the Democratic nominee if they weren't me, which uh, I was both impressed by and a little surprised by. Um, but I liked it. And, and when I talked about politics being tribal, it turns out that I activated a different tribe. Um, Fair vote activates a tribe, a tribe of pragmatic problem solvers. Uh, and the question is, can we build a political movement out of that group? Um, that's my goal. And one of the things I tell people, Rob, is you don't need 51% of people in this tribe. You need maybe 10%. That speaks to um, Stefan Katz, if I'm saying his name right, asks, uh, so RCV as a reform arguably is it urgent given the intensive polarization decades in the making. What do you think is the next step in helping other states get on board? I think we need to do what Fairvote's doing, which is if there's a state that um, that's new to RCV, then you try and pass it in a town or a city. Uh, there was a Utah state rep who said to me that he was converted when a nine hour nomination process got shortened to an hour and a half. And then he was like, oh, like this makes my life better. Um, so, 
you can start at the local level. You can go straight to the state level, and there are at least two ballot initiatives I know of um, that that are launching. You actually like Rob. What are the two states that are that just announced the the statewide uh, ones? Um, Missouri and Nevada both have sort of final five, top four ballot measures in play. For yeah, so you can go straight to the state level via ballot initiative. There are twenty five states that allow that, um, or you can start at the local level. You can do both. Um, so those are the things that we have. We should be working on right now. Uh, we have ten months um, to try and get some of these things done in twenty two, um, and then it's going to get harder, frankly, like uh, for twenty four, in my opinion. Well, easier in some ways because there'll be more energy paid. The energy is going to shoot up in all directions after the midterm. So we have to try and get these reforms passed um, at the state and local level this year, if we can. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say there's, you know, we had a historic number of state legislative bills last year. Um, about 30 states had had ranked as voting bills that were trying to advance the cause, some really ambitious, some smaller, but all sort of getting a conversation going and uh, three states passed uh, something that, that, that moved the ball. But um, cities are really, intriguing because that's something where you know as, as Rob is a city guy Rob is Mr. Yeah. City I'm, I'm, I'm a city guy because it's a level where people you know eight motivated people who are well informed and have a problem to solve in their city can often make something really exciting happen so we think about 500 cities could be using ranked choice voting within just two, two three four years if if we um really get uh that conversation going. There's a group, Rank the Vote, which is sort of working with 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 us and with 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 state groups and trying to get them empowered to 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 get organized and raise money. Love Rank the Vote. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And, and I, I think you know, there's there's of course a lot of other players. There's Represent Us. There's there's uh, United America Institute for Political Innovation. But the, the, the city one is something that say if, say, if, say if you're on this call and are looking for something to do, sort of tapping into what your state group is doing and looking to see- You need seven do. friends, Rob says, eight seven to the magic friends. number. Seven According friends. to Rob's studies, if you get eight people together, <laughs> you can do that's it. it. That's, that's the magic math. So, so uh, Ryan Warner asks, what ways have you found to be effective to turning people onto election form to find your seven friends and put that at the top of their priority list? Is there- there's something you've felt, seen, said that you think kind of helps turn people from being couch potatoes on this and get active. The overlap I have found uh, is that if people are tired of the duopoly and you tell them, look, uh, these reforms will result in third parties being able to compete, then they get very excited. Uh, so uh, this could be people who are disaffected from either major party. This could be people who who are libertarians or another party. Um, they could be pissed off independents. Um, but I, I found there to be a relationship between someone's wanting to move on from the duopoly and their eagerness for some of these reform measures. Yeah. Um, so you sort of tap into someone's sense of yearning for something more and and have and sort of have a solution for them. So um, here's another question that uh, Jane Newell asks, and she has a specific example, but I'm going to broaden it a little bit. But in, but in New York City, there was opposition to ranked choice voting in addition to the support. And do you have a sense of why there was opposition, whether it's going to be enduring, sort of what it, what it, what it means for our efforts? Oh, of course there's going to be opposition. There's going to be opposition everywhere. Uh, if you propose anything new, some people are going to get very upset about it. Um, in in this era, they'll think there's something nefarious about it, you know, that, that it's going to like hurt them in some way, um, facts notwithstanding. Um, so uh, I, my, um, my expectation is that anywhere you try and do this, uh, the powers that be are going to try and submarine it. <laughs> Probably. And, and I will also say, even if you take the average voter and you say, hey, how, how about doing this new voting system? Like the average voter, if they're not educated about it, might say, like, I like the current system uh, or I'm, I'm like suspicious of any change or whatever it is. Uh, so th th there's a, a need for resources and investment and education and volunteers and people making the case. 
if you have the resources, I think this is a winning case. Um, but if you don't have the resources, then you should expect some people to be kind of knee jerk uh, against it. And you shouldn't blame them for it necessarily. Like we should just take the onus on ourselves and be like, look, if I explain this properly and get the resources behind it, um, it will win, but I should not expect it to win just because I see something that at this point, the majority of voters don't see. Someone asked about your book and autographed copies of the book and that all seems fun, but I know you have a lot of causes that you wanna support, but what I was just sort of, um, sort of to lift up from your book is that you get into a lot of very specific ideas like simplifying the how we pay taxes, um, uh, ways of dealing with this, you know, problems with, with Facebook disinformation. What are the ideas that are in the book that aren't about ranked choice voting are ones that you're finding a lot of interest in as you, as you barnstorm the country? I ran for president on universal basic income. Um, and at the time I thought the problem was that people had never heard of universal basic income. And after they heard of it, they would want it. Uh, and now people have heard of it and want it. Uh, but we still don't get it because our government doesn't really respond to the needs and wants of the people. Um, and so now I've uh, found myself um, starting the forward party and championing these reform measures because I think it would make the government more genuinely responsive to uh, the needs of the people. So if you ask um, what are the changes in my book that I, I champion, uh, I, I want our economy to be measured by how we are doing. Right now, the economic measurements of the stock market and headline unemployment, GDP growth, um, they're all going to tell a different picture than if you go to communities around the country, which you know I haven't been to all of them, obviously, but I've been to a lot of them. And there, there's a lot of suffering, a lot of displacement, uh, and we have very ideological, unfortunate conversations about those things. Um, if you took out the numbers, you'd see that we're 28th in the world at infant mortality and public education and clean drinking water. Um, so the biggest idea is to try and evolve our measurements. Um, and a lot of people are excited about that. I, you know, I, I have meetings with people who are all over that uh, because they understand the need. Um, some of the other proposals in my book are around uh, media and social media reform, to your point, Rob. Um, and more people are honed in on those things now too, because they see how bad the polarization is getting. So there's a interesting uh, question from someone with a familiar name. My sister, Marina Ritchie uh, writes in, so how will ranchers voting help us accelerate action on climate change? Oh, hello there. <laughs> uh, ranked choice voting uh, has the advantage of making it so that uh, people can express their preferences and our representatives should have to deliver for us. So right now, if they, if let's say we don't do anything on climate change, you come back, uh, the Democrats still gonna get elected in a, in a democratic seat, uh, you know, regardless of whether anything got done on climate change. Um, if you had ranked choice voting, then you'd have more genuine accountability and more competition and pressure for someone, anyone to deliver on climate change. But right now, if the Democrats don't deliver, they'll come to you and say, hey, you're stuck with us. <laughs> and, 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 and you are like, you know, you're like, well, I'm, I'm in a blue area. There's no one else for me to vote for. Um, so again, this is the incentives question is, uh, should our representatives actually be asked to deliver for us? And if you think the answer is yes, then you should be for ranked choice voting. That's the answer. So there's a couple questions here about the relating to how New York City had a slow time getting its results done. Um, um, you know, people cast their ballots in, in efficient ways and historic numbers and cast them well, but the uh, Board of Elections took a while to get the results in. How is that a, sort of on the ground as, as a participant in that election and as a New Yorker? And um, how big a problem is it, do you think, when you uh, have a change like ranked choice voting and it has something like that happen where it like takes a while and then they, of course, messed up the results the first time that they ran them. Oh, what, one of the things I joked about, but Rob, I'm sure you felt very strongly, is that you should not confuse the BOE's uh, shoddy administration <laughs> of RCV with uh, the merits of right choice voting itself. I mean, New York City's uh, Board of Elections is notoriously uh, incompetent, honestly. <laughs> so they, this is not, they didn't have like a, 
sterling track record before this and then all of a sudden like the complexity overwhelmed them i mean they, they tended to drop balls um regardless <laughs> and so um the fact that they might have dropped a ball here was egg on their face um but even despite that if you think about it uh you know like everyone's um accepting of the outcome um the results were transparent like the votes actually got released so people could parse through all the the data and the political science uh, nerds could go crazy. Um, so and so and this is with, frankly, a pretty incompetent BOE. So uh, you could make the counter argument is like, hey, even if they botch it, things work out okay. Um, though we we shouldn't expect people to botch it the way the BOE did. Um, and I, I imagine that they'd be better the second time around. Um, so th that's my thought on it is that like people shouldn't confuse the BOE for the process. Yeah, and I think that's a good way to say it. And I think the um, the reality is that there are other things that we do, like vote by mail in, in Oregon and Washington and California, where that takes a long time for the ballots to be processed finally, and at least the way that they do it there. And um, and they'll have results that are two weeks later, just because of that ballot processing, nothing to do with uh, ranked choice voting. And then Colorado has vote by mail, kind of gets it done really fast. And that's kind of the, the ranked choice voting um, answer as well as you can do it quite quickly. You just have to have your systems in place and 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 be smart about it. Hey, Rob, you must have been chopping at the bit. You must have been like, I'm going to get up there and count this fucking vote myself. <laughs> <laughs> it was, Let it was, their it, vote it, do it. It, 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 it was interesting because I, I was here, you know, uh, you know, many states away, but the media did turn to fair vote uh, sort of for, for a comment here and there. And so basically there was the election on one Tuesday, then there was the botched result the next Tuesday, and then the, the corrected final outcome the following Tuesday. So every Wednesday of that sequence was sort of like 10 straight hours of, of talking to reporters. But there, were, there, were, there was a lot of storytelling too, and ultimately a really good story about like, your city is a pretty complex city with a lot of people who are arriving into the United States from other countries and becoming citizens and 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 a lot of diversity of language and so on and ranked choice voting really they handled ranked choice voting exceptionally well to their credit it's a simple system like people will try and like you know cast it as being really complicated it's very very simple yeah um i will see see what else okay so there's a question about you know prospects and so on and i'm and 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 um I'll say as an answer to the to Mark Kelly's question about you know will will there be Republican states and cities entertaining righteous voting? There are um, you know these ballot measures like one in Missouri, but here's the thing: righteous voting can get support within legislatures in all kinds of legislatures, right? So so there are Republican legislators that really like righteous voting. There are Democratic legislators that do. They don't always like it for the same thing, right? Yep. They don't like it for the same bold you know, really transformative changes, but they can like it as an instrument. And I guess, how, how do you see that balance between the bold and the compromise and the, and the what you really want and the incremental uh, as you- Well, the, the, the red state arguments that I've seen be effective are that this saves money, it saves time, it avoids the need for a costly runoff, who the heck wants to deal with that? Uh, and um, one thing I've also seen is that Instant runoff is better branding in red states than ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting, for whatever reason, seemed blue to a lot of people. <laughs> Whereas, like, instant runoff seems, which, which, by the way, I think is the original name for this thing was instant runoff. Um, it, it, it appeals more to conservatives. Maybe there's like an efficiency argument. So, like Rob said, different people like it for different reasons. Um, and I imagine the people here are very practical and don't care why you like it. <laughs> you know? So, uh, so if, if if I'm trying to make it happen in a red state, I'm just like save money, save time, uh, you know, just get it done um, uh, in a in a way that'll like uh, you know be a, a more responsible use of resources. Call it instant runoff. Like uh, uh, it it's been effective um, in different places for different reasons. There's 23 uh, cities in Utah that signed up for it last year. They had if they didn't do it, they'd have to have two elections, August, you know, uh, first round, a win of the field, then a, then a November runoff. And that instant runoff, faster, cheaper, better set of arguments was the, the overwhelmingly compelling case for them. Save money, get it done faster, shorter campaign season. 
Did, was it called instant runoff in Utah as well? I know it, it's still it's it, it's part of the dialogue there. Um, it it is it is generally called ranchers voting. It is it is part of the narrative. I'll say that I actually I didn't invent ranchers voting, but as head of fair vote in the '90s, I was at a conference and we were calling it preferential voting. And this guy came up to me and this is better than preferential voting. That's and weird. And he said, you know what? You should be calling this instant runoff voting. It's like one of those kids, like, you know what? You're absolutely right. <laughs> so we actually, you know, didn't coin it, but we popularized instant runoff. And then the reason why it's not called instant runoff today is that in San Francisco, after the big first win for it there, they couldn't get the results done quickly. It took three days and they knew they were going to take three days to do it. So they said, you know what? We don't want the to look bad. So let's call it ranked voting. That's how you vote. It won't promise instant results. And so they use ranchers voting and it does actually convey how you vote well, but it is interesting. It was sort of the, it just caught on as a how you vote versus what the outcome looks like. I've got it guys, I've got it. We just call it patriot voting in red patriot states. Voting. It is, it's it's patriotic voting. It, it is, uh, patriotic it's, about voting. Choice. it's about freedom. It's about, it's about freedom, it freedom is about, voting. <laughs> it is about freedom, it is, yeah. So free vote. So. Someone out there can start a group uh, to liberty vote voting. Along us, free vote. So, and, you know, fair vote. You, you don't have to change your initiative. You could go free vote. It's true. Just have a free, <laughs> no, free website. Fair vote, free vote. Right? Yeah, it's. But it is. It is. I think very much in the American tradition. In fact, James Madison uh, proposed the idea of second choice voting in one of his thoughtful letters to someone. So it it, it has some interesting origins. Um, so we are almost at the witching hour. Um, so I'm going to wrap up in a second, but before I wrap up, I just wanted to give you a chance to have a final word uh, about what you're hopeful for this year, what you want people on this webinar to take away. Well, uh, I'm hopeful that we're going to get a lot of stuff done uh, in the midterms. And what I'd ask the people here to do is to volunteer for Fair Vote, uh, volunteer for the Forward Party volunteer to make something happen in your community or another one, you know, like it is the internet. You can just beam into Missouri or Nevada <laughs> and try to make things happen. But pick a couple of initiatives and reforms and communities and then put your shoulders into them. Because if eight people can make it happen in a city and there are 226 people here, 236 or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, according to my math, that's 29 cities that we can get these things done on. And look at that. That's, uh, you know, a big step towards Rob's 500 city vision. So adopt an initiative, adopt a city, volunteer for Fair Vote, volunteer for the Forward Party, or some other organization that's trying to make this happen. But we need your help. And with your help, we're going to run the table in 22, because the appetite for these reforms is shooting up. Everyone sees that it's not working right now. Everyone sees that the incentives are broken. Um, so let's go make it happen in dozens, hundreds of communities around the country. We can do it. Fair we vote. We can do it. Woohoo! Fair vote, free vote uh, on, on our way. And you know what? I think this is my belief that um, I've, wor I've worked on this a long time, but I believe that this is as you approach the end of a marathon, you see the finish line. And I think that in these coming years, you know, part of the because of the challenges of, of, of our time, but the real fixes that it provides, we can make this a 50 state solution. This, this, this can win everywhere. It can have a lot of state wins and it can ultimately have a congressional passage. And it's well within the constitution to change single choice to ranked choice voting, multi-member districts with fair representation is, is a simple act of Congress and we can do it. This is the fix. Yang read all the books and settled on this as the most impactful way we can save the country. Save the country vote. And there it is, forward. So um, thank you, Andrew. Um, really a great pleasure. And it's uh, wonderful to have you on the Fair Vote Action Board. That's our, again, our, our sort of action component, which relates to how we hope uh, Andrew can make change happen. So I'm gonna um, wrap things up. So we'll uh, post this recording on our YouTube page and Emily promises to do it by tomorrow. Woo. Um, so you can see it again or share it with your friends. Looking ahead, we'll have a lot. Watch it again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's our 30th anniversary. So Fair Vote 30, uh, we'll, we'll be doing some fun things around that. We'll have our inaugural Fair Vote Awards, more, more to hear about that. Um, and uh, But some of the topics that you can expect is what Congress might do on voting rights 
and electoral reform. They're actually doing some pretty important things on voting rights and electoral reform, uh, debating the John Lewis Act, the Freedom to Vote Act, and uh, a smaller measures uh, like on, on ranked choice voting provisions. The impact of this past year's re redistricting on our elections. Um, our local congressman, former favorite board member, Jamie Raskin, talking about his new book, Unthinkable, about his uh, uh, year uh, that he's lived through with his son uh, dying and, and his, 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 his work on impeachment. Progress for more use of ranked choice voting in the 2024 presidential primaries. Alaska's first use of ranked choice voting. That's a, that's a really big one with Lisa Murkowski on the ballot, competitive governor's race. Um, and a new round of viable chances to win ranked choice voting in cities and states. And we want to lift up the people doing that, the stories that go with that, the reasons why we need change. And January 23rd, for those who like math and numbers, is one, two, three. Uh, so that is the second ranked choice voting day, and we're going to be excited to be uh, uh, working with folks on that. So stay tuned for January 23rd is ranked choice voting day. That's some fun stuff. That is fun stuff. It's the second ranked choice voting now day. So uh, uh, we, we are, uh, I think, have things in the works for you to cut a video for, for, for people to play up for, for ranked choice voting day. So stay tuned. RCB for day. Woo! Yeah, so thanks Our, again. Are in red states, Patriot Voting Day. <laughs> <laughs> All the best for 2022. Thank you, Andrew. Bye, Rob. Bye, everyone. Let's make it happen.